This is TomorrowPictures.tv. Tomorrow Pictures. Do you know who I am? Who are you? I do. This is your Radio Almanac, the first of a new series. TV. Here we go. Hi again, everybody. Welcome back to the TV Fury podcast. And it is true to form, TV and Fury again this this time. We've got uh, a lot to talk about. Uh, Sean joins us via Skype from, um, I shouldn't say that, we probably owe them money now, which we don't have, from uh, the Big Apple. What's going on, man? How much? How you doing? I'm all right. I just finished a little uh, three-mile run on my basement treadmill, and uh, I'm so I'm soaked in my own stink right now, and then I'm sitting on an exercise ball so that I don't funk up the uh, computer chair. So if we had the video element going right now, uh, you may hang up on me. And this is down in the bat cave with all the equipment. It's my mom's basement, yeah. Okay. Now, like you said, I, I love your visual. The other day we are trading emails with Sean goes, I, I like that we arrange these these uh, podcasts, and then he has this vision in his head of, like that it takes me three days to, like, crank up my my machinery and get the right vacuum tubes in place and you know corral like real uh, uh lightning bolts from the sky like i'm making some sort of uh audio visual frankenstein down here so, yeah i picture like the, like the professor from the simpsons kind of type character what's his name um simpsons fans will hate us for not being That's able to right. think of it off the top of our head, and I can't right now. That's all right. I got nothing too. I got nothing. Um, yeah, no, it's very much like that. One day we will we will tinker with the video down here just so people can see, but uh, there's not a lot to see here. It's uh, it's pretty ugly right now. Anyways, uh, that's not our topic though. We're not going to talk about the aesthetics of, of or lack thereof of my basement. We are today going to hit on sort of the story. The soup du jour, uh, it sounds good, I'll have that in sports right now, which is this University of, of Miami, or the U, as they're called, although I don't, you. I don't, I don't like that, because, I mean, I understand they were, you know, sort of nationally the first U, but yeah. in this region, like, University of South Dakota claims to be the U, and they even advertise themselves as such, and of course the University of Minnesota, which is a much larger school than either of those, um, they've long been the U as well, so I don't, to me, that's kind of nonspecific. Do you agree? Yeah, I think it, I'm assuming it was just based off their tremendous football success, but right now they're just kind of AU other than the U. So right, they're I'm illicit, the illicit U. Yes, that's what so. that's what we're talking about. The the story on uh, the Yahoo Sports website um, filled with all sorts of intrigue and scandal and prostitution and abortions and yachts and good grief, it was. Um, they, they chronicled in this um, investigation that was months long, uh, Charles Robinson uh, was the lead reporter. And, oh, by the way, Charles Robinson, once upon a time, was hired at the student newspaper at Michigan State by a guy named Chris Solari, who I replaced at the Argus. So I got a funny little wow. Facebook note saying he picked him up as a JUCO, actually, uh, <laughs> come, come to East Lansing. Uh, hey, yeah, I'm, Chris, I'm team JUCO, so I'm all for that. There you go. Chris took a chance on an up and comer from uh, some JUCO, and uh, here it paid off for him. So, but anyways, uh, really, really in depth. Uh, they claim, and and it's not like they they claim. I mean, their their primary source here is a guy named Nevin Shapiro, who's serving uh, roughly uh, a lifetime in jail uh, for a, a almost what a hundred million dollar, uh, or I'm sorry, almost a one billion dollar Ponzi scheme, something like that. Um, anyways, he he uh, implicates. 72 hurricane football players over roughly a decade that were involved in this sort of behavior. And there's got some great, not only great documentation in terms of credit card receipts, but they also have some really damning photos of, uh, you yeah. know, like a school president staring lustfully at this, this $50,000 check from this, this little booster, uh, who was nicknamed little Luke because, uh, he had kind of, 
picked up the uh, the torch of illegal activity from uh, Luke Campbell uh, of Two Live Crew fame, um, or Uncle Luke as I call him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we all do. Uh, anyway, so uh, this is a uh, made shockwaves around the, the country. First of all, Sean, just your I don't know what what was sort of your initial reaction to to reading this piece because it's not like this was um, you know Mike Shashevsky's Duke basketball yeah, program. Yeah, exactly. We all knew if you saw the thirty for thirty that ESPN did that, and even if you've ever seen them play, that the U's got some bad boys. They've got some guys who kind of skirt the law, but this kind of uh, uh, brought to life probably every stereotype that's ever been uh, perpetrated about about those guys yeah i think the detail of the story was kind of what caught my eye I mean, it was just so thorough uh which we'll talk about a little bit more but i mean the story just went on and on and on uh, detailing you know this place of 72 players and then it had sidebars on each player and what they were alleged to do so i think it was the detail that you know kind of surprised me but the actual scandal itself even some of the details that i think maybe surprise some people like with like you said the yachts and the sex and the abortions um things like that it's especially with division one football and basketball which the story kind of also goes into i think at this point it's just almost impossible to be surprised unless it would be like you said coach k or roy williams or bobby knight this had happened to but these yeah. schools like Miami and the SEC schools that kind of seem to trade titles and scandals each year. At this point, it's just, for me anyway, it's impossible to really be surprised by the fact that there is a scandal. I think the depth of the story um, kind of make, makes this one stand out a little bit. And the question yeah. of will the NCA, you know, how severe will the penalties be whenever they do actually finish their own investigation? It, these guys have almost become caricatures of themselves when you think about, and, and these are, you know, serious offenses when you're talking about not just things like, like money that's illegal by NCA standards, but maybe doesn't, you know, overtly harm anybody. Um, but when you're talking about, you know, abortions and orgies and I mean, you know, who knows what else? Frankly, there wasn't as much drug talk as I expected, but then you've got just some of the ridiculous things like the whole, the whole deal where, you know, sort of the code word for, some of these like sex parties was Teddy Dupay, who was like this short white dude who played basketball in Florida a few years ago, and now is somehow going to become infinite, infamous because his name is linked to this, or how uh, one of the players got uh, extra cash for drawing a penalty for an excessive celebration during a game, and you know the sort of things that are just just comical and and uh, you know uh, like I said, it's uh, yeah that was part of like. There were times, like, reading a story, I was, like, chuckling. Off, yeah. If not outright laughing, which I don't know. Like, the story was very serious as far, and it would, you know, sometimes it didn't name players who were involved with certain things, like the abortion and some of the other activities because of the sensitivity of it. But some of the details, I just couldn't help but, like, laughing because it, it almost is, it just reminded me of either Blue Chips or the program. Yeah. Yeah, which were two completely... Very enjoyable, but also over the top movies. Except exactly. now it looks like they weren't over the top. Right. At least based on Miami. Yeah, no, it's, uh, there were some Jesus Shuttlesworth uh, elements here too. So let's break this discussion sort of into two parts. Uh, kind of the, the, the idea of the effect that it's going to have in terms of rules and the big, um, debate that's going on nationally and really being pushed by some pretty heavy hitters in the media. Uh, in regard to does the NCA need to change the way they operate or overhaul, not just change. And the second part being sort of the reporting of this. Obviously, you and I have some interest in talking a little shop there since this is sort of our uh, where we uh, earn our money, uh, so to speak, not from this website, of course, because we do this all for the people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so on the rules, and I'll be honest, I don't know what to think. And, and, you know, in my day job, I do cover a Division One school, but there's no question it's on a very different level in terms of overall finances and interest than we're talking about here with the elite BCS, you know, national championship contenders in football. But I, I, I read something the other day that I thought, and I think it was Ryan Rosillo from ESPN who said this, that the problem is not the rules of the NCA, it's human nature. Because you're, because, you know, guys like to put it simply, guys like chicks and cars. 
And as long as that's true, there will always be people who are going to break whatever rules are in place and, and greed will sort of overcome. And I agree. That's, that's totally my problem with this idea about, well, the, the players are being extorted. Uh, the, the, uh, education that they receive doesn't mean anything to them because they're, they don't value education anyways. And they're just trying, it's a minor league for them. Um, but for me, if you're going to, you know, just start paying them, well, then whatever they're allowed to be paid, someone else is going to pay them more. Yeah. And so to me, that doesn't solve anything. That, no. that's, that's one of my problems. What, you know, how do you go about this in a way that, isn't just you know where it isn't just a pro sport. I, I don't I don't know where it goes, but to me that's that's a fundamental problem with with where a lot of people want this to go, including people who I think are really smart guys like Jay Billis and Jason Whitlock. I, I just don't buy. I, I think they're fooling themselves. They think you know if you give a kid a stipend or or let let him have advertising dollars, that somehow everything's going to be clean and above board all of a sudden. No, definitely. That's that, I think a great point. Just. Like you said, there will always someone will want more than they're getting. So if even if you give the guy, I haven't really read a lot about what people's ideas are about how much they should make, and I I have nothing. You know, I'd be fine with players getting paid. I have no, um, you know, the NCAA isn't a mythical thing for me or amateurism isn't something that you know I lust after, even though. I'm an MIAC rube, and part of Division III's allure is that these guys are just quote unquote playing for the love of it. Um, but at the Division One level, even the Division Two level, um, like you said, that even though they are like pseudo professionals, but if you give them a thousand dollars a month, there'll be guys like this booster, you know, giving them five thousand a month. So mm-hmm. I think you would see, like you said, the same type of scandals. Maybe they may not be as shocking because now we're under the illusion that these guys, you know, don't receive anything and seeing them get this much, you know, kind of shocks our sensibilities. Um, so maybe the scandals won't be as shocking, but I, I don't think paying them would end this type of stuff. No. And, and I, I mean, I, I guess I understand where people are coming from when they talk about exploitation in the sense that. Yeah. The, the athletic directors, the school presidents, and the head coaches are getting rich, whereas the players, you know, essentially aren't even allowed, you know, very enough enough money, to, you know, for sort of a, the, the kind of regular college student expenses, a pizza and a movie on a weekend. And, yeah. And, and some of that comes down to how they manage their money, too. You know, I, I know Division One student athletes who I've covered who have been smart enough to be able to actually, like, put away a little bit extra. Like, maybe they find a slightly cheaper – you know, housing arrangement than they're budgeted for within their full scholarship. And then they're able to, to leave scho- uh, college with no, no, uh, no school debts, which is a far cry from where you and I were attending yeah. you know, private schools. And, and in addition to that, they have, you know, maybe enough, enough money to sort of get themselves established right away in the job market. Um, so I, I, I don't, but, but the exploitation thing, that one's hard because, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to limit what coaches and administrators make? I mean, I, I guess in theory you could, but I think you'll run into more legal issues there in the sense that they are, you know, sort of fully operating in the the capitalist market. And I imagine there's some sort of law that prevents you from from capping wages like that. Yeah. And, you know, kind of going back to like how much you would pay them, like you said, that, you know, the idea that they're being exploited because other people are making money and they're not. But that's. I mean, you could start at the high school level, but I mean, high school coaches get paid. A lot of them get paid, you know, at some of these bigger schools fairly well. Obviously, their players aren't compensated for what those guys make. Same thing at the D3 level. Um, you know, people there make okay money. Um, you know, so I don't think you can just say that just because other people, the coaches and administrators and such are making money. I don't think that's necessarily exploiting the players. Um, the thing with the NCA that I sometimes have more of an issue with is just some of the little ridiculous rules that you'll hear that a player might violate. Like if they just want their family flown in, you know, to see their final home game or something that turns into this bureaucratic mess because they're, you're not allowed to do, yeah. do things like that. Those are the rules that I think, you know, yeah. Are yeah. So my ridiculous. favorite is, my favorite is the, the litigation on what you can and can't, give a kid to put on a bagel and I'm, you know, that's not even, 
uh, that's not even far fetched. Like that's legit. Like you can, I want to see you can give them, you can only give them like cream cheese or peanut butter, like on certain situations or, you know, it's, it's, pat, it's patently absurd. Um, yeah. the way that that plays out. And things like how coaches are allowed obviously to leave anytime they want, but if a player yeah. transfers, right. you know, they're punished, you know, things like right. that. Right. We're going to, we're going to take our awkward pause here for a second. All right. We ready pause. for this? Uh, America? Okay, hold on. We're going to pause. We'll give you some elevator music, perhaps, if I can find some, and then we'll be right back. It's a pretend commercial because uh, it's the price we pay for free software. Okay, hold on. We're back. See, it wasn't that long. I think if I timed that better, I could probably do it, but the yeah, problem is like you one have the, second. Yeah, and you don't have the counter on your end, so I, instead I like to draw attention to our amateurness because uh, we are amateurs, unlike what you want to say about these uh, student athletes. But, you know, the other the other part about it is even if you do change the system so that they can let's say live moderately or maybe maybe they do well even. Maybe they get paid, you know, like the way that the way that I might, let's say. Well, th- again, that's not the kind of problems we're talking about here. We're talking about guys out on yachts and it, you know, what do you have against club. yachts, Terry? Well, See, I'm not anti-yacht. It's just that anti-hope. I can't I can't afford yachts, <laughs> and and I'm you know not only have my college degree, uh, you know I've been in the working field and in a semi-productive member of society for about ten years, um, and that that's the problem. One of the problems I have is just the idea of excess. Like I don't yeah. think these guys want. And that's what you see with Terrell Pryor. Like people say, well, he you know he deserved to to be able to have, have pizza in a movie. Well, that's not what he's doing. You know, look at Terrell Pryor. Look at look at what he wears. Uh, look at this jewelry he has. When he's when he's selling memorabilia from Ohio State, that's what he's doing with it. You know, what I mean, and maybe maybe he does give some back to his family. I don't, I can't say for sure, but I just have a hard time believing that he's budgeting himself as a college student the way that you and I did. Um, you know, and again, you can make the argument, well, he shouldn't have to because of what he's bringing to the school, and that's fine. But I, I just don't think that. If if you're in a system where your your argument is well these kids don't value education so just give them cash well how about educating them in how to use their cash a little bit then I, you know that's to me that's maybe a whole other issue but it's got to be all all tied into how does this all work yeah the prior thing like was even I like the I don't remember all the details but the car aspect was one thing but the whole Ohio State thing over the memorabilia I thought was just kind of strange and. Like especially if you compare it like to the Miami situation, because it, it's in certain situations they were selling like their own memorabilia, correct? Which mm-hmm. I don't yeah. see any issue with that really. It's it's their stuff. I don't understand why you can't sell your stuff, but right. anyway, um, I should true. say that overall, like you know, when we first talked about it, reaction like to the story, like. I don't know if it's because I'm getting older or or maybe this doesn't happen to people as their age, it's just happening to me. Like like college scandals and performance enhancing drugs are two things that I'm getting less and like I just they don't bother me nearly as much anymore. Especially like with um like steroids, you know, the there's such a big thing in baseball and I'm getting more and more like I think these guys should just be able to take what they wanted as long as it might be better if it was actually regulated in some way right. the same thing with college scandals it's like like so they just keep coming and coming and coming <laughs> and in six months i mean the ohio state thing seemed like it was you know the most ridiculous thing we had heard in a while especially with trestle's involvement and now a few months later it's just topped tenfold by miami well yeah and, and you've had you north, just know there's another north, school out there probably yeah you've had you've had north carolina you've had oregon um, you know, it's, it's up and down right now. The, the thing that is, is, you know, sort of laughable, laughable to me though, is that how people keep bringing this up in the context of ha ha, you got caught. My school would never do that. Yeah. And, and an example the other night was even Jim Tomey hitting his, his 600th homers as, as a member of the twins, mm. twins nation rejoices. And, and I could, you know, tell you there were a handful of tweets that I saw where people, people were, I know people I know were saying, oh, and he did it all clean. And I'm going, okay. A did he really? I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying he's been in any way connected to it, but we don't know. You you yeah. can't pretend to know. And and B, why do you keep throwing that in there when you when it's the like you know what I mean when it's entirely possible that something will come out in five years and and it turns out he did. I, people, it's like people want to validate 
um, validate themselves on, on the back of that they weren't a part of a scandal, which which to me I don't it doesn't make any sense. Plus, it's a pretty uh, uh, risky stance to take, knowing that so many people after the fact now have been proven you know or found guilty of so many things. Yeah, and especially with Division One athletics, I don't know any school that should be. I mean, you think of a school like the University of Minnesota, which has a pristine academic reputation and for the most part has just absolutely pathetic teams right now. But yet their basketball program has been pretty much each decade, 70s, 80s, and 90s, involved in major scandals. Um, so, I mean, it can happen anywhere. It probably has happened anywhere. I think uh, Ricey had a his column today was kind of the same thing that you know, if someone grabbed a gopher's kid as he was coming out of practice and told him he could, you know, take a boat on the St. Croix and there'd be ladies there, there'd be nothing, you know, he would do it just as likely as a kid down in Miami. It's, you know, there's nothing. Right. Each school this could happen at, and it probably is happening at. Unless you wanted to hold out for the Lake Minnetonka cruise, right? Well, you have to wait till you get to the Vikings, I believe, to... Yeah, I don't know. I think you're once of age. Once you're of age, though, why not? You know, I mean, uh, party boat, whatever, yeah. man. It's all it's all good. So let, let's switch gears then a little bit. Let's talk about sort of the reporting side of this, and we'll probably lose half our audience here, but I don't care. We do this for our own good, anyways. Um, so to write this kind of story, and I've, I mean, obviously, I haven't written anything to this extent, but you know, I've had to attempt a couple stories that were, you know, semi salacious or or had some, you know, hints of, of uh, or not hints, but definite. Uh, illegalities in play. First of all, you need somebody who will squeal. And in this in this case, um, you know the, the guy is Nevin Shapiro, and again he's in jail, and he claims the reason he is squealing. And, and I will credit Yahoo Sports for um, mentioning this part fully. Is that you know he's mad because he got mm-hmm. thrown in jail. The people he did all these favors for basically turn their back on him and and won't help him out now that he needs them. And so he says, you know what, I'm taking them all down. And and he was I don't know. I, I mean. I, I can't say he was honest. I don't know how you can call a guy who was involved in a Ponzi scheme of that that magnitude and, and the sort of behavior we're talking about honest. But you know, he at least that's at least believable, and and he's not <clears throat> hiding. You know, he's not playing it off as well. I just you know whatever. I mean, he's he's basically admitting he's in for for revenge. Yeah. Um. So that's the first element you need. But beyond that, I mean, you know, they they uh, explained and and they've done some interviews now nationally, um, in terms of how they went about this process and how long it took and. They documented everything. I mean, if you if you read not only their main bar but their sidebars, their columns, their their documentation. I mean, this thing is like an IRS audit, and uh, it was it was impressive, um, just in terms of the scope and the length and just the I guess the depth that they went into. That that surprised me. I mean, it was um and it sure felt like when when I'm reading that, it, your your first rea- my first reaction at least was like, wow, there's no there's no wiggling out of this one. No, exactly, and. Uh, you mentioned his motive, and I thought it was interesting. that The part you talked about was a little further down in the story. I think at the beginning, you kind of get the idea that he's doing, you know, he was convicted on the Ponzi scheme, and now, you know, he co- cooperated with the government, told, you know, he says, I'm guilty of that. Mm-hmm. And then that he was kind of revealing all this almost like he's, because he wants to be a truth teller now. And then a little right. further down in the story is the part that you talked about where he basically said that these guys abandoned him once he went into jail. So I think that was definitely the driving force behind what he did. That makes you wonder, okay, if someone had visited him or one of if Vince Wilfork, one of the players mentioned constantly, had given him $5,000 or his family or whoever, would he have revealed any of this or not? Um mm-hmm. I think eventually, just I think he would have because he was also shopping a book uh, that Yahoo was able to talk him out of pursuing, so he would just talk to them. Um, but I think that it was definitely- interesting too, and I, and and that made me wonder if you know is it going to come out after the fact that they you know did they pay for some access? You know what I mean? Because if he's going to write a book, I mean he's going to make some money off of that. So why why is he now willing to spill the beans for free? to make Yahoo a bunch of money and then not be a part of it, especially when we know sort of his MO or his character to, to me, that that's questionable. Yeah. Although I, th- I think, you know, just based on Yahoo's reporting on this story and reporting that Charles Robinson has done on these other college scandals, which he seems to break every few months, 
I, it seemed like that would have been something that I think they would have mentioned in the story um, if they would have paid for. He, you know, he was obviously the primary source. Right. Um, in some of the cases, the only source. It, it just seems like something they would have mentioned if they had done that. They seem like they're yeah. fairly up and up on um, disclosures like that. But who knows? We, that might be something that comes out. Well, and that's a good segue to a story I read today. And, and again, granted, it, it seems to be written by somebody who works for sort of a, a, a University of Miami fan site. I think it was called All About All About the U. Um, and, and he went through point by point with all the allegations from all 72 players spelling out. He even made a chart of saying, OK, well, here's what evidence they say they have against, you know, person A. And in, in a lot of those cases, in most of those cases, the only real hard evidence was um, circumstantial and or the word of Shapiro, who, of course, doesn't have a lot of credibility as a, as a truth teller at this point. Um, so I think, you know, that's interesting that that. Um, People are going to start picking this apart now. And again, I'm not saying, you know, Yahoo did or didn't do anything wrong. But one of the things I thought as I'm reading it was, boy, they used some unnamed sources. And, and they, you know, like in the case of the uh, alleged, uh, you know, uh, financed abortion, they left out some names, they said, to protect people. And, uh, you know, I know, uh, you know, as a, uh, the member of the quote unquote traditional media, that wouldn't pass mustard with us. You know, we don't, I, I've never been allowed to use an unnamed source. And, and, you know, they say, well, the only time we could probably do it is in a case like this. But it, it always leaves you open then more to more criticism. And especially in a case like this, and this is kind of a big point that, you know, you're, you're talking about, you're no longer talking about the traditional media breaking this story. You know, this isn't Dan Levitard at the Miami Herald. This is now an online site that, as you said, has developed a ton of credibility. Um, and yet they still are online. They still have maybe different standards. I don't want to say lesser or looser. But than, than we do in the in the traditional media, um, and, and I think that opens up a lot of questions about again where does this go and you know no they're not dead spin but are they the New York Times you know what how how does all that play out in your opinion in terms of moving forward or moving on to the, the next sort of major scandal? I, I think at this point that Yahoo is I would I would actually consider them the mainstream media. Um, okay. I would think of them as something like. If a story appeared on ESPN.com, I sure. think they would be considered mainstream media, even though a lot of times the .com is separate from ESPN, the network, and a lot of times maybe even has more credibility than things that you see on the network, which are on the entertainment um, side of it. So I, like I said, I have definitely make a difference, you know, I think there's a difference between Yahoo and, say, Deadspin, or if it would be not to denigrate free blogs that people write. <clears throat> <laughs> but um, I think at this point, Yahoo has really established itself. And a lot of their reporters okay. are old newspaper guys, basically. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, that I don't have I think they are mainstream with this. Um, and I think, you know, the fan site you mentioned, I will want to look at that later. Um, it definitely sounds like, you know, some poor schlub that's kind of sees the future and it's bleak for his hurricanes. Um and is trying to salvage something out of it. And it did, and and there was certainly you felt like that. You're like, oh, this guy's got sour grapes. But he he did so in such a way that was cal so calm and matter of fact that, like I said, even had a chart about it that you're going. Well, well if you have, yeah, if you have charts, you're considering you're the source. Well, exactly, you're considering the source, but you're also going. He kind of makes some valid points, or or at least to where it's worth taking a closer look. And again. You know, we both know that there's there's so much more that goes into the story than runs with the story. You know, th they may have had sort of secondary anonymous confirmations and then were able to just quote Shapiro as the only source, but knowing they had secondary things. And I think somebody from Yahoo, whether it was Dan Wetzel or Charles Robinson, went on the Scott Van Pelt show the other day and actually came out and said – that there's even more to the story than they were able to report mm. because they couldn't confirm some other things and then it could actually get worse. So now keeping that in mind, that sort of offsets a little bit uh, of this account I read. But I, I just think it's interesting that we're now in that time where there are fan sites who can question these yeah. sorts of things and, um, and, and it can lead to you know hopefully good discussion or kind of a way to check the media, which in theory is a way that you know sort of checks the system. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Levitard because I haven't read it, but I saw someone discussing that. I think he wrote a column on the whole thing. And he's 
rightly or wrongly, and I think he admits this has kind of developed a reputation as being he's very he'll side with a wronged athlete much of the time. I mean, he wrote tens of thousands of words defending the Heat last year, and over the years he's done it. So I, you know, a column like that isn't surprising. And actually, the Miami Herald is taking a lot of heat, if you will, um, for how Yahoo got the story when it was happening in the Miami Herald's backyard. Uh, whether someone like Yahoo can devote more resources to something like this right now than traditional papers. Yeah. So, yeah, no, that's a and that's a great point. And that was another thing I thought was wow. You know, even even if this were happening at the school I covered, there's no way I could be given. I'll, you know, maybe the summertime being the only exception, but yeah. not the kind of time and, and manpower. And and again, you know, and it, you have to have people be willing to talk. And to me, that's always one of the key parts of a sort of salacious story like this is who's going to give up the goods. Um, and, well, and, sorry yeah. for interrupting. It no, go reminds, ahead. makes me remind or reminds me of the the Gophers uh, cheating scandal with the tutor, which was broken by the St. Paul Pioneer Press, of course, um, George Dorman, who eventually went on to Sports Illustrated. And right. that story was it was the tutor was very upset and, you know, went to Pioneer Press and spilled her beans and you know, basically took down Clem Haskins and the basketball program for a few years. So it is, you know, finding that sometimes just one source. Um, the weird, the Miami thing, it's so crazy because this, it is just one guy, but he was so involved in the program. It's kind of staggering. Part, I think one of the things that made me, you know, we're talking about things that made me laugh in the story was he apparently would run out onto the field with the team. Yeah, um, he had to lead him through the tunnel more than once, I think it said. Yeah, which is just a humorous like wow. visual. Um, right, right, cuz he's like 5 foot he's like a 5 foot 5 white dude and uh he's in all these pictures with these just gigantic NFL players and he he totally doesn't fit in and it's enough to just see him and have it raise suspicion <laughs> and and you know, and you almost look at him and be like that guy's up to no good and yeah, then sure exactly. enough, yes. <laughs> yeah, and then apparently there's a story in the new ESPN the Magazine that just came out and it's a college football thing with a quote from the president um, who says that she's very, you know, persistent on NCA compliance. She's able to see people on the sidelines who look a little shady and point them out. And obviously that was not right. quite the case. You said there's a, one of the great pictures of this story is um, her and I believe the basketball coach with a check from this guy. That, <laughs> Just staring at it. And, and it's funny because, you know, I think it's the my was it the Miami president. Somebody came came out publicly and was part of the committee that nailed USC yeah, yeah. And, and ripped them, and now they turn around. So it just goes back to what we said earlier about, you know, you better not gloat, you know, about stuff like this when it happens to other people, especially if you're in a situation like Miami where, you 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 know, you're known to have issues in the past. And um, anyways, uh, I, I like that we've said spill the beans approximately a half dozen times today. That's one of those phrases where it's like, if you really think about that phrase, it's kind of gross. Um, well, so is this story. What's that? Well, so is so this is story. story. So it fits. Guess, that's a good point. But like, you know, we, we need, um, you know how we have like Urban Dictionary? We yeah. need like, yeah. um, and there probably is. I, I just haven't looked it up. But, you know, like a, uh, a, a history, dictionary of history let, let, like tells the origin of Spill the Beans because I guarantee that was not invented in like, you know, 1993. That's, uh, I think there that actually is a book. On just is that it? thing that just that goes back and looks at phrases like that. And like was you know was that because people must have eaten a lot of beans at whenever this was right? I mean, not they were know, very me, messy. I, I don't know what the right. I, I don't I don't get it, but I'm glad I'm glad there's um, bean spilling happening here because it gives us good stuff to talk about. So and one thing I I wanted to mention this when we we're talking in the first segment, um, just about the scandal in general of how and I tweeted this last night. I found an old story in the L.A. Times on the UCLA basketball dynasty of John. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yep. There's a booster. His name was Sam Gilbert, and he basically was, it was well known even back when he was operating. And then later it all kind of came out that he was basically doing what this guy did for Miami, but with the UCLA players, you know, giving them cash, et cetera. And in the LA Times story, it was almost a paragraph that could have been, it was almost verbatim to a paragraph in the Miami story where it was cash, cars, and also paid for um, the abortion for a player's girlfriend. Um, yeah. So these things were happening literally 
40 years ago, almost 50 years ago with, you know, the UCLA stuff in the 60s. So it's just been something I'm sure there, you know, there was people before Sam Gilbert. Um, I just think it's college sports is just something that people gravitate toward, you know, for good reasons. People are very passionate about it, but it also is going to attract some of the shadier characters who, mm-hmm. um, you know, want to in, obviously have a lot of influence over the events. Yeah, and and uh, the Gilbert thing. I mean, that was a uh, that's a great example because not only was it as you said almost fifty years ago or whatever, but it was um it also happened under John Wooden's watch. Yeah, who you know is by all accounts this thing. right this yeah saint and a model and you know Mister Inspiration and one of the greatest coaches of all time and everyone thinks everyone assumes he's clean and the standard for you know moral uh for upright moral behavior and uh, and yet he was uh he apparently had a blind eye or at least sold the fact that you know he yeah not know what was going on i mean you do um, this poor miami coach who t- who took over oh, man. apparently not knowing they were even under investigation right um, which is something you think the school would maybe mention during the right. interview process but i mean i feel bad for him even though like i said coaches always land on their feet in college sports so right even if he doesn't end up even if Miami doesn't work out, he'll end up somewhere. But he must be feeling a little beleaguered at this point. Yeah, I think to your point about there always being shady characters hanging around, I think that's part of what goes with college sports, though, because these kids are in this current system. They, you know, a lot of them don't have a lot of money. Um, they're more accessible because they're out in the community. They're not living in you know million dollar mansions behind gates like yeah. like NFL players are, yeah. and therefore it's sort of a more accessible form of celebrity. And, and you're, you know, and all you have to do is, you know, buy a kid a pizza and, and all of a sudden, as, as Shapiro said, then they just start rolling in and then all of a sudden they all want to meet you and they're all getting introduced and they all sort of know what the deal is. And I think that's part of what's unique. Now, getting back to our original conversation, if you change the system, does that go away? I, I still doubt it. Um, you know, and so we'll, we'll see. And not to mention it, just from, again, where I'm coming from at, at Somebody who who spends a lot of time with a non BCS program, um, if you redo this that part of the system, now you're talking about well, how are things different with you know non revenue sports and and yeah. uh, how are things different with males and females and Title IX and and uh, tax exempt status and and all those kinds of things. So you're talking about a complete overhaul. Now maybe that's the way it has to go at this point. Maybe it's that far broken, but um, it's not going to be as simple as okay everybody now can you know it's a free market so i i don't i don't know where this goes i don't know if the nca can i don't know if people understand all the ramifications i mean if, if you're talking about losing their nonprofit status yeah uh, or tax exempt status or whatever the specifics might be that's a pretty major deal and they will do sort of whatever they can to avoid that because it will decrease what they're able to do because all of a sudden they have to start you know paying taxes on on half of everything or whatever so um, I, I don't think it's as simple as well. Let's just start paying people. Or let's give kids money for pizza. I think it's a, a lot more complex than that. I, yeah, and I I don't think that this will spark a major thing such as that. Um, sure. I just don't see him making that drastic of a change. And also, you know, you, a lot of people now are talking about what the penalties will be, and obviously the NCAA has to complete their investigation because it's not the penalties won't be based on just the Yahoo story. So it could be, sure. you know, months, years down the line before we actually find out how this ends. Um, but it is worth noting that, you know, people are talking about the death penalty, um, which the last time it happened to a football program, of course, was SMU, which was also, weirdly enough, a 30 for 30 documentary. And it's always been said that NCA would never do that again because of how it destroyed that program. And I was looking last night and the last two college programs who have suffered the death penalty were something called Morehouse College Soccer and McMurray Tennis, which is a Division three program, which brought in wow. a player from Nigeria or something illegally. So you think... They made, they made $12 that, off of that. Yeah, transition. that's who they've given the death penalty to <laughs> wow. when you have all of these you know, major scandals that have happened in right. football. Just You can think of the ones with USC, Alabama, Ohio State. So I just, even with huh. how crazy this one is, um, it still doesn't seem like something that, I, I still don't see him shutting down the program, but 
No, and it, and it's funny to me in some ways. This adds to the the swagger at the U. You know what I mean? Like I, it's one of those programs where, y- yes, they will put out the appearance for a while that that everything has changed or whatever. But um, in the end, it's part of their allure. It's part of what built them as a program. And um, I, I think in some ways it sort of enhances their image. You know what I mean? Like yes, it will hurt in terms of the penalties levied, but in terms of street cred. Uh, dis- in, in terms of dissuading a kid from Dade County from wanting to go play for the Canes and walk out with all the smoke and the whole bit, I, I don't think that does that one bit. So, no, I would um, agree with you. And I just had yeah. an image of um, that fan site you were talking about, if, whether it was written by Eric Peterson. No, uh, Eric Peterson and or Brad Schlossman, um, two friends of mine who are huge U fans. And actually, I think we may have a piece, hopefully, coming from Brad uh, on this topic in oh, the nice. near future. And they both been to games – uh, in Coral Gables, and um, uh, they're, they've been there. They've been fans for a while, so um, we'll, we'll have to get their take one of these days. But uh, w- Sean, we've almost eaten up three full segments here, so we should probably let the people go since okay. there's okay. none of them are listening at this point, anyways. Um, Hi, mom. Hi. Yeah, exactly. Not my mom's not listening, that's for sure. <laughs> but but anyways, uh, so that's I guess that's it for this this week. Um, Sean, I'm glad we were able to do this and uh, good stuff. It'll, it'll be interesting to see where this goes if anywhere other than just the typical sanctions or if this is more of a landmark thing, given that it is on, piled on top of some other recent issues. But nonetheless, it makes for very good fodder and uh, stuff to keep us employed you know, at our free website. Exactly. It was, yeah, I think like you said, it'll be interesting to see if, not to drag this segment out even more, but I don't know if you should punish Miami just because they're the culmination of all these other scandals right. we've had. But that kind of seems to be, the sentiment that a lot of people are like, okay, we're fed up with it. Let's, you know, take it out on someone. There's obviously enough there for, you know, the NCAA to take it out on them anyway, but I don't think they should be punished for other people's sins as well. Yeah. Maybe they should not be allowed to play a game outside of the state of Florida for like three years. So they can go play, they'll have to play Florida state and uh, Florida and FIU and FAU. And uh, uh, yeah, that'd be, Again, that wouldn't that wouldn't hurt them. There's just well, that's I don't the thing know, with like taking them off TV. Right. You heard all those other. I mean, they're playing another team that then can't be on TV. So there's so many. Yeah. It's all entangled. With it. I heard one interesting uh, theory today, and we're dragging this on more, but whatever is that uh, maybe they should be able to. They should not be allowed to have fans at home games. Therefore, <laughs> negating not only the financial uh, benefits, but all of a sudden they have no home field advantage. Plus, then you know uh, they're not. The, the teams they play are not punished because when they can go on the road, people can be there to watch. Uh, I kind of like that theory. I, I would be in favor of some sort of weird punishment. Um, I, I th- but I think we have reached a point where we need to start thinking outside the box. One of our readers who, who had a guest spot this week suggests that the NCAA can start finding programs. And, and again, that's – unless it's going to be something really heavy-handed, that's the only way you're going to make this stuff stick is to, to get in the pockets of the people who have the deep pockets. Uh, and who sort of run these programs behind the scenes. So I don't know. I, I think we may be at that point, though, where it's, it's time to go beyond taking away sco- two scholarships and a practice a week because uh, clearly that's not much of a deterrent at this point for, for the big boys, given the, the potential gains financially. So um, anyways, but we'll, uh, we should wrap this sucker up. And, uh, Sean, thanks for being here. We'll, uh, we'll see what next week brings, but uh, whatever it is, we'll talk about it here on the TV Fury podcast. Sound good? All right. It was fun. All right, man. Do you know who I am? Who are you? I do. This is your Radio Almanac, the first of a new series. TV. This is TomorrowPictures.tv. I'm running for president one more time, but the camera's on me. It's about 70 years old by that time. Uh, I could talk about sugar diabetes. I could talk about uh, I could talk about the people in nursing homes. We can talk about a whole bunch of things but that's irrelevant to America. Bring Social Security down. That's the time for Jesse to run at 75 years old. Jesse Jackson running in 2016. Look out, Barack. Production services provided by Tomorrow Pictures Incorporated. The story is in the telling. <laughs> 
Tomorrow Pictures. The story is in the telling.